The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21, beginning at verse 23. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you that authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. If you will answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Well, they discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask them, why did you not believe them? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. And then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? Well, the first they answered. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe. This is the Gospel of Christ. Gracious Father, as we open your word this morning, we ask that you grant to speaker and hearer alike the presence of your Spirit, that hearing we may understand and understanding and obey to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. The young carpenter stood at the entrance to the temple, gazing around. Had he looked closely, you would have seen in his eyes a mixture of sadness and fury. How is it possible for a place of worship to be used to cheat people. They had to change their hard-earned cash for the temple coins. These and these only were the ones to be used for the purchase of the sacrificial animals. How is it possible that the place where the God of peace is worshipped to become the centre of revolution, where the need for Israel to fulfil her destiny by driving out the despised Romans and once again becoming an independent nation, rules overrules the responsibility to worship God. Injustice from without <coughs> and oppression from within both rule. The young carpenter seemed so insignificant in the face of so much political power and powerful ideologies. To the surprise of friend and foe alike, he began to make a whip and drove out the money changers. He turned over their tables that they were using, scattering their coins. And in his anger, he cried out from the Psalms, My house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. And temple worship was stopped until order is returned. 
Only the day before, Jesus had entered Jerusalem seated on a donkey. Israel's king, humbled and lowly. Now look at him. The warrior king doing battle so that his father's house will be what it was supposed to be. A place of prayer for all people. A place where God is worshipped. The humble car carpenter had now taken centre stage. Both acts that he did were provocative. Both raised the same question. Who are you? By what authority do you do these things? Those asking the questions are the temple authorities, the ones who had the right to exercise authority in the temple. By what right does Jesus bypass them and begin to act as if he had the right to do so? For only someone with greater authority than the temple leaders could do such things. And that's the point. Jesus' actions have always been completely in tune with his teachings. All through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John have shown how Jesus' words and his works provoke the same question. Who is this man? Each of the Gospels, in its own way, has a point at which the tension that these questions raise reaches a breaking point. Matthew has arrived at that point now. From here on until the end of chapter 23, he will be in debate, in dispute, and challenge with the Jewish leaders. All around this is the question stated or implied, Who are you? By what authority do you do these things? Word and deed combine to lead to the inevitable conclusion that this man is the Messiah. That is his authority. Neither friend nor foe had yet seen what, what kind of Messiah. Neither friend nor foe has seen that the Messiah must die to fulfill his mission. Neither friend nor foe has the slightest inkling that Jesus will be raised from the dead. But for now, one point and one point only is being stressed. Only the Messiah could do these things. This carpenter from the provinces with no official standing, this insignificant man who yet does highly significant things, this travelling preacher with the unimportant and unlearned as his followers, this man is the Messiah. That was hard enough to grasp. But harder still was what kind of Messiah he is. No one yet knew that his humble self-giving would go to the extent of submitting to death, even that most cruel of deaths, the crucifixion. In these two scenes, the triumphal entry and the, the cleansing of the temple, we see Jesus in his power and in his humility. Each attribute is inseparable from the other. We know that this is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one by whom worlds were made. We also know that he is a humble, powerful man. What they did not know then, but will perceive later, is that he represents humanity as we were meant to be. <laughs> but our second lesson shows this very clearly. If great power is to be given to the sons and daughters of God, it can only be given with safety to those who will exercise it in humility. Power is only safe in the hands of those who act as servants. 
Listen to St. Paul. And being in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. Did you notice the repeat of the word form in this translation? It's the same word both in the Greek as it's translated here in the English. When God revealed his nature and character, it was in the form of a servant because that is how the Trinity relates to each other. Each member is subject to the others. Each member is always seeking the honor and glory of the others. Each is doing the will of the others. That is why Paul is saying to the Philippians that they should treat each other as better than themselves. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. But I can tell you, for me, it's one of the toughest things I have ever had to attempt. Which should not surprise me. What Paul was asking the Philippians, and through them asking me, and through Paul asking you, is to behave as God does. If we want to know what it means to love our neighbour, it doesn't get any clearer or any simpler than this. And just because it's clear and just because it's simple it does not make it easy. And that is what the Holy Spirit is busy transforming us into. This is what is meant by take up your cross daily and follow me. This is what I meant, what is meant by love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. Learning to cooperate with the, this project of transformation by the Holy Spirit will be one, of the, one, if not the, central part of our lives' journeys. Power is safe in the hands of people like this. It is not safe with anyone else. Just take a look around you. Everywhere we see power being abused. Great despots oppress whole nations. Men oppress women. Women oppress men. Sex trafficking is one of the largest forms of modern day slavery, earning organized criminals billions of dollars annually. More than two million children are exploited in this way and the world's most vulnerable, poor women and children, suffer the most. And why is that so? Why are they oppressed in this way? Simply because they can be. That's what this world is like in which we live. And one of the church building in London, where a friend of mine was a vicar, to go from the sublime to the ridiculous in one sense. The church had two entrances. One was for the aristocracy, and the other was for their servants. How far we so readily stray. And folks, I've used examples outside of our culture. I could multiply them more if I'd looked within our own culture and seen what we have done in oppression in that way. But there's no need to say more. The list of injustices, of cruelty, of inequality is almost endless. And what can we do in the face of this? Listen to the carpenter from Nazareth. Watch him. Copy him. Become like him. Every little light in the world pushes back against the darkness. Be prepared to speak up against oppression and exploitation wherever it's found. But... Do so with compassion 
and hear this one well, folks. It's a hard one. Do this com with compassion for the exploited and the exploiter. Listen to the carpenter. So that if he wants you to do more than you're currently doing, he has an open heart to speak to. And remember too, that every little helps. You may not be able to do much. We may not be able to do anything much at all. But we can do something. We may not be able to do great things, but we can do small things, and they matter. I was sharing with Ian the other day that I had managed to put a ding into our car and had to take it in to get it fixed up. And I used the panel meter that's behind the op shop. In discussion with them, it came out that I attended this church, and so she then began to tell me how much she appreciated the work of the op shop. How she saw and knew and understood the good that we were doing in the community by giving money away. I thought, you know, I didn't have a clue before I worked here. It walked in there. The effect of our op shop with all that it's doing around our part of this world. One tiny thing but the small things matter. But as I've said, as we do this challenging of people, remember the exploiter is loved by God too. Sometimes their crimes are heinous, but they can and will be forgiven if they repent. For us, it is essential that we remember the story of Jonah, who was charged by God with going and challenging a nation who were destroying Jonah's nation, cruelly. And it's no wonder that Jonah ran away. But the Lord brought him back. And there he sat under his fig tree after the, um, the um, under a tree, after they had repented and said, I want to die. How can those terrible people be accepted by God? Remember Jonah, that's not the way it should be with us. For this is the hardest lesson to learn, yet it's absolutely central to the teaching of these two readings. I've often said to you that when we are right, that's when we are in the greatest danger. It's so easy to look down our noses at those we think are wrong. It's only a short step from there to disliking them, and it's even a shorter step to thinking that they are less than you. We are all, forgive me for dragging you down to this level, but I think I have, I'm only telling you what the scriptures say. We are all only a heartbeat away from praying that most terrible of prayers. I thank you, God, that I am not like. And then you fill in the way. Here's how one man described our world. The culture we live in has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe, say, or do. Both are nonsense. You do not have to compromise your convictions to be compassionate. And both our Lord and Paul are saying the same thing. Only with a heart attitude of genuine respect for other people can we begin to say you are wrong. Anything less will lead us to repeat the injustices we see in the world around us. Our Lord's teaching, life, 
and death all gave the same message. His actions wrote large the, the, the truth that he was proclaiming. And he longs to share with us the power that he has so that we can see more of the same miracles that he saw. Many times the power will be re released despite us out of God's compassion for those in need. The challenge to us today is to begin by treating all people as equal and with compassion and better, especially those with whom we disagree or whose lifestyle does not fit in with how we perceive the gospel. Folks, each and every step in this direction's direction lines us up with the will of God. And it lines us up with the purpose of God for each of us. The God we serve and the God we adore. Every step in this direction leads us to become individuals and a church that our Lord can trust with his power. God bless you.